Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted on this episode to be talking with comics creator Lila Sturgis. Lila, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. I did not ask if you wanted the shared audio and video. That is one thing I should make sure to ask. Either is fine. Okay, cool, cool. All right. I always like to make that available for folks. Um, whatever feels best there. You you have a lovely setup here with a very official looking microphone. So I can tell you've podcasted before. I have. I am the co-host of a podcast that is uh, going to be released soon. And um, I'm also a musician. So this uh, doubles as a podcast mic and as a vocal mic. For oh, recording. Love, it. love it. Love it. I, I was not aware of those creative endeavors. I, I know the comics world, but I don't know the, the musical and podcasting world. Yeah, I'm full of surprises. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so curious about the the initial steps of your story, how you got into comics, and sort of the author origin story. Sure. It's funny because it was never my intention to write comics. So many of my peers, you know, they knew they wanted to write comics from the time they were eight years old. You know, you've talked to Dave Justice mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I, I think he knew when he was very young, he wanted to write comics for a living. And I did not. I grew up not reading comics, not caring about comics, not being remotely interested in them. I really liked um, the Super Friends when I was little. And mm -hmm. I really loved the 1978 Superman movie. Mm -hmm. Um other than that, superheroes held no interest to me. <clears throat> so it wasn't until I got to college and one of the first people I met at college was Chris Robertson at the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. And we became best friends. We were best friends all through college. And Chris was a huge comics nerd from way back. But he had really great taste in comics. And he introduced me to a lot of the people who would go on to become my favorite creators, a lot of the people who um, would go on to be the vertigo creators, the sort of British invasion type people of the late eighties, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. Neil Gaiman, <clears throat> Pete Milligan, um, Grant Morrison, obviously Alan Moore, all those guys, um, artists like Duncan Fregredo and Mark Buckingham and, um, Chris Bacallo, you know, like these <laughs> sort of like guys we think of as, you know, classics now. But, you know, at the time when we were in college, they, they were exciting and cutting edge. And this was something that I had no idea comics was. I didn't know that comics could be cool and interesting and hip. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's all these people were was cool and interesting and hip. And they were telling stories that I was really interested in. And so that's when I started reading comics and, you know, I never really got into superheroes that much, even though I've written superhero comics, several I, of them. Yeah. Yeah. Several <laughs> superhero comics. I never really have been a huge superhero fan, um, but there's always been enough in comics to keep me coming back. Mm -hmm. And now today, I think we are in the goldenest of golden ages of comics where they're is a comic for absolutely every taste for every person. And, you know, there's just, um, there's more comics than you can shake a stick at. And I love it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's sort of this assumption that when you say the word comic immediately, it means superhero, but uh, e even going way back there, there have been so many different kinds of stories from Westerns to thinking of like the, the older EC comics and now absolutely we're in this um, sort of renaissance and being a teacher too, I, I enjoy what's available for middle grades and then older readers and uh, all of the different levels of readership that come with the medium. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, you wouldn't know it from going into a comic book store in the late 80s, early 90s. It was all superheroes all the time. And if you're lucky, they had one, you know, like one shelf that had some of the more interesting stuff. And obviously they were catering to their audience. It wasn't like they were um, they were out to get 
you know, independent and otherwise non-superhero comics, but mm -hmm. it was hard to find the kind of stuff that I liked. And I found it a little alienating. I think a lot of times going into comic book stores and just not seeing anything that really interested me. And so I, I thought if, if I was going to write comics, I wanted to write things that I thought would be interesting. And when Vertigo started, I thought, well, if I ever write comics, I would want to write for Vertigo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I had no intention of writing comics. I thought I was going to be a rock star. And that's what my sole intention was in my 20s, was to become a famous musician. Love it. Love it. How the, how the different parts of our life take turns. And yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, finding that didn't pan out. <laughs> <laughs> It, but you're creating music, so it works. It's still part of the story. I am creating music. I was in a band in Austin in the 90s called Those Who Dig. And we are now on the 30th anniversary of our debut CD. We are recording a new album. Love so it. that should be, it's so much fun. It's so interesting to see how all these people have grown and changed in the, the intervening decades. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Dave Justice a little while ago, and I was talking to Dave on an episode of the show. And one of the questions that I typically ask is the one that I'm about to ask you about positive collaborations, people that have been kind in the in the field and um, those positive experiences, titles you've worked on, things like that. And your name was uh, among the names that he mentioned. It might have been the name that he mentioned. I'll have to go back and fact check the episode. But uh, I know that he said Lila Sturgis was was really nice to me. And uh, I know that you worked on Fables with Dave. So um, yeah. any any particular positives that have been along the journey? Well, let's start with Dave. Dave is a, a longtime friend and collaborator. And we did we we became friends because we had this idea for a comic called Public Relations that did eventually get published. It got published by one first comics and no one read it. And it was canceled after 12 or 13 issues. Um, but that kind of cemented our friendship, this sort of love for doing. We wanted to do a really funny comic. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is something that drew us together. And then we got a chance to do the Fables Wolf Among Us comic and we did the Ever After book. And we've been trying to find something to do ever since. And now the two of us are working together uh, with Joe Eisma, who is mm -hmm. one of our favorite artists and someone that we've been trying to get to work with forever on a new project for Mad Cave. So that's very exciting. Love it. I should have worn my Mad Cave shirt. I just got one in the mail. <laughs> um, yeah, this this has been a wonderful chain of conversation because I talked to Joe Eisma about Morning Glories and then Joe talked about Dave and I believe both of them have talked about you. So this is a, a circle of wonderful collaboration. Yeah, um, so that was a that has been a, a beautiful ongoing collaboration. One of my favorite collaborations was the time I got to work with Darwin Cook. Oh, and yeah, yeah. that's the one I like to bring up the most because I get to say that I worked with Darwin Cook. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was for House of Mystery. It was a five page story that he drew and he just had some extra time and wanted to draw a story. And so I sent him the script. Um, somehow, you know, Shelley Bond got him to agree to do it. And I sent him the script thinking, OK, well, may, you know, it if I'm lucky, he will poop out these five pages and I'll get to say Darwin Cook drew my story, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Instead, I get back this long, lengthy email from Darwin saying how excited he is to work on the story, how much he loves it, all these ideas that he has for it, all his, his influences and inspirations that he wants to bring into the thing. I was floored. I couldn't <laughs> believe that someone, you know, that talented and that huge in the industry wanted to take this little project so seriously you know it was a real it was a real treat and it just a testament to the kind of artist that he was and the kind of person that he was mm -hmm. and uh, that's something I don't think I'll ever forget yeah yeah when you were talking about vertigo comics I was just thinking about house of mystery I've been revisiting some of the 
the first issues of uh, the book and exploring and just enjoying the the supernatural elements that are there and the world building. And I love how there's that story that sort of jumps in uh, as you're sort of working through the story. So we have both the the outer story, the inner story, uh, and really enjoy those books a great deal. And, and a great example of another thing that comics can do sort of outside of the typical superhero story type. Absolutely. House of Mystery was an incredible book to work on because I got to work with so many of my art heroes working on that book uh, because we had a different artist in every issue, you know, and it was like, can you do a five, six, seven, eight page story? You know, a lot of people, they wouldn't have time to drop a whole issue or certainly not an, a story arc, but yeah, they could do six pages or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's how we got people like... Um, Gilbert Hernandez, you know, who otherwise like, I was never going to work with Gilbert Hernandez, you know? Um, and it was great. It was fantastic. <laughs> and um, yeah, that that's a real, real special book to me, House of Mystery. And it's a shame that it's out of print. Now it's very hard to find. I'll also mention for um, superhero fans out there that you have some really interesting work in Blue Beetle um, that's getting ready to be a, a cultural phenomenon a little more attention on blue beetle with the the film uh sending it all the good vibes and hoping it does well for the the world of dc um, but i i love the moment in your take on that character where he's given the keys to the city uh and then it sort of becomes this moment of like oh wait what are you what are you asking me to do you're asking me to to guard the border is that what you and so really interesting political uh, commentary there and just a great direction with that character as well. Thanks. I had a lot of fun with that book. You know, it was, it was a hard act to follow following, you know, John Rogers and, and Keith Giffen, you know, mm -hmm. writing a book. and Raphael Albuquerque drawing it. Um, so <laughs> that was a tough act to follow. And I, you know, I did my best. That's all I could say. Uh, I really enjoyed writing that character and I had an absolute blast doing it. I remember one time I was at a convention and um, it was like the DC what's going on panel or something. And Dan Didio was running it and he's like, so Lila, what's going on in Blue Beetle? And I was like, well, I just wrote this really fun scene where they're all playing superhero themed mini golf. And Dan's <laughs> like, no, no, no. Like what's what's happening in the book? Like what's <laughs> he wanted me to say, like who they're punching, you know? Right, right. And <laughs> I don't really care who they're punching. I was really fear for the mini golf. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and you have to find those ways to craft and uh, to imagine what's possible, especially with characters and storylines that have been around for a while. Um, so, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And that kind of stuff is is fun to play with. And I, for me, superheroes because they aren't sacred things. Um, I think I always liked playing with them sometimes in ways that people didn't appreciate. Um, and it's interesting now to see the way that superheroes are done, you know, it, like in the MCU that are a lot less reverent. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe I just, you know, was a little before my time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I was writing those same books today, instead of 15 years ago, <laughs> maybe, maybe people would like them more. I don't know. I, I enjoy I enjoy what you have done with that and what you continue to do and um, the other part of the the question that I was going to ask you about experiences was um, folks that you wanted to shine a spotlight on uh, any particular creators in the field right now that you um, would like to say hey this person's doing cool things um, one of my favorite creators right now is Vita Ayala um, I think they are an excellent writer, um, just a really cool person. And, you know, I just feel like their books are also vivid and interesting and um, have a really strong voice and point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, I really love Teeny Howard. I think she's phenomenal. Um, I love, who else do I love? G. Willow Wilson, Cecil Castellucci. I'm naming a lot of women. That's not on purpose. It's not like I, <laughs> I came here 
thinking, oh, I'm only going to name women. Women sure are doing are. great things. They really but are. Women are doing great things in comics. Those are just the first people that popped into my mind. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, there are so many fantastic cartoonists uh, doing cool stuff. And it, like, I, you know, I was saying before we started recording that I have a terrible memory for names. And this is where uh, I've painted myself into a corner because now you're going to be like, name some of your favorite cartoonists. And I'm going to be like, I can't think of anyone. Raina Telgemeier. <laughs> <laughs> Rain is a good one. Rain is a, a, an awesome Raina cartoonist. Will be like Raina. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So, so many great um trungles uh trung lead win mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. yeah i could go on and on oh yeah yeah lot, lots of great work being done e- even the the color scheme in magic fish the the way that there's that symbolic sort of work happening it, yeah the, just amazing amazing stuff um so i believe my next question if i'm looking at my notes in the right way is um the question of what you hope readers take away from your work that is a great question. I was looking over the questions with my wife and I was like, yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, I can answer that. <laughs> oh, wait, this is a question I actually have to think about. Um, what do I hope readers bring away from my work? Well, I think it depends on which work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. There are things that I've written for adults where the goal is to express something. You know, House of Mystery is all about expressing the sense of longing and frustration um, that was due to me being a transgender person, but not being able to express that. And so that's what that book is about. If you go back and read it, um, I mean, it's about a bunch of things, but that's primarily what it's about, although it's very difficult to, but once you know that, you can kind of go back and look at it and go, oh yeah, that's what that's about. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it was really more about like, I don't have any idea what you're taking away from this. I just know what I had to put into it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's the case for all of my work that's aimed at adults. But when I'm writing for younger readers, I feel like I want to, there are things that I want to say to younger readers. And in a book like Girl Haven, Girl Haven has a very clear message which is that, you know, love is stronger than fear and that it's important to be who you really truly are, even though that can feel hard, even though that can feel scary. Um, But that when you are who you truly are, the right people will love and appreciate you for it. Um, And when I was writing Lumberjanes, we would have these wonderful conversations about what kinds of things that we wanted the Janes to be sort of exemplifying, not not so much teaching because it's not a preachy book, mm-hmm. but but demonstrating the ways in which we can put words to our feelings. I feel like so much of great middle grade writing is conveying to people of that age. You know, when you're 10, 11, 12 years old, it's like you're having all these feelings. You don't always know how to talk about them. You don't have the words. And I feel like so much of what Lumberjanes does well is providing kids that age with the words for what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned both of those books because they were, they were on my list of books to mention and uh, having been a middle grades teacher for a while. uh, I love the way you capture that idea of going through something and not quite having the words yet. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I also love comics, because sometimes a visual depicts an experience in a way that uh, you don't maybe know the words exactly for yet. Yes. And I think that's why one of the reasons why comics resonate so much with kids that age, mm-hmm. because get, you can get from the visuals and the text together things that you might be able to pick up on just from the text. And seeing the the images, I feel like, brings it so much more alive. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Especially for kids who, who might struggle with reading just print, right? Mm-hmm. Very invitational and uh, accessible in that way. And also deep and thoughtful at the same time. Yeah, yeah. As deep as you need it to be. Mm-hmm. And I'll also say I appreciate that um, I gave you a question that you kind of 
had to explore because I've seen a couple of the podcasts that you've done and the interviews that you've done. And I thought, well, I want to ask some questions that maybe haven't been asked before or take the conversation in some new places. So I'm glad I got that. Glad I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I try. I try. Um, so the, the next question is probably pretty boilerplate. It's one of those questions that I just like to make sure that I give folks that come on the chance to share about works and things like that. And so it's the, the next creative directions, the upcoming appearances and the current spaces to connect question of um, those things that you would leave listeners with so that they can go and find out more. Sure. Um, I guess, the, you know, the most interesting thing that happened recently was that the uh, the Dune movie graphic novel that I wrote got nominated for a Hugo Award, mm -hmm. which love those very, books, by the way. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> very surprising to me. <laughs> um, and I may actually be going to China where the World Science Fiction Awards are being held to um, probably not win that award, but um, but to be there and see whoever <laughs> wins it, get it. it might be <laughs> Um, I have a book coming out from Legendary Comics called The Science of Ghosts, which is about a, uh, she's a trans woman. She is, uh, she has a doctorate in forensic psychology and she, uh, she is, calls herself a forensic parapsychologist. Mm -hmm. She examines ghost behavior and uses it to solve crimes, um, that one I'm real excited about. And I'm, I don't know when it's getting released though, which is very frustrating. Um, and then I'm working on two other projects right now. Um, the, uh, the unnamed Mad Cave project with Dave Justice and Joe Eisma, which mm -hmm. it has a name. I'm just not allowed to say what it is. And um, TBA. A book called TBA. <laughs> yeah. And a book called The Heavens that I am co-writing with Lev Grossman, which is, um, I, I guess I'm not allowed to talk about that either, but just know that it's really awesome. And um, I think people are going to freak out when they read it. Love it. Love it. Sounds like yeah. there are many exciting things on the way and glad to have you back on here anytime. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the last part there, any web spaces where, where you'd like to share that people can connect? Oh, my gosh. It feels like the web is kind of falling apart. You know, I would always mm -hmm. say that I'm Lila Sturgis on Twitter, although I don't spend as much time on Twitter as I used to. If you're on Blue Sky, I'm Lila.bsky.social. Um, otherwise, um, you know, send me a postcard i don't i don't know it's a pure time on the internet right now carrier pigeons are great they never go out of style um there's a monty python reference in there so totally as any monty python approved form of communication is totally fine fish Perfect. slapping uh <laughs> banging together whatever you got Love it. Love it. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much again for taking the time to talk and uh, for going with the Monty, Monty Python uh, reference there as well. <laughs> hey, I'm a nerd from way back. If you want to do a quote off, I'm your girl. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will plan it. There there might have to be a podcast segment, the the great quote off. <laughs> love it. All right. Well, well thanks again. My pleasure.